Hey, good morning. Uh, my name is Mike, and I am, uh, I'm really excited to uh, have the opportunity to, to preach from the book of Zephaniah, uh, and just uh, really humbled this morning to, to be here um, at Corndale doing this. Um, when I was a kid, I remember when my dad would leave on work trips. He'd be gone for days, sometime a, sometimes a week, but in my little kid mind, that felt like an eternity. And uh, when, when he would get ready to go pick him up at the airport, this is back in the day when we could walk right up to the gate at the airport, pre-9-11, and uh, watch people come off the plane. I was so excited to see my dad come home. There's also times when I was growing up that I, I remember when I was a disobedient and stubborn child, I would uh, argue just to argue. I would pester my little sister. I would draw on my homework rather than actually doing my homework. And I remember times when my mom would look at me and she'd say, Michael, you just wait till your father gets home. And I would be like struck with fear. I would, I, would, I would plead with my mom, like, hey, don't tell dad what I've done. And if she didn't relent from that pleading, I would be lamenting, awaiting my father to come home. It didn't matter if I was a faithful son or a disobedient child, my father was going to return to me. And this morning, we're looking at the book of Zephaniah, and we see Zephaniah say something similar to God's people. Israel, just wait till your father comes home. I wondered, do you live every day with this awareness that one day you will stand before God and give an account for all that you've done in your life? Does that animate you? Does it motivate you? Does it humble you? I think most of us, the, the coming day of the Lord is not much more than a theological concept. It doesn't drive us like it ought to, but Zephaniah wants to change that for us this morning. Before we jump into Zephaniah's message, I want to I look at his major theme, this day of the Lord, for a quick moment. The day of the Lord, this expression is found 18 times in the major and minor prophets mainly in the books of Joel and Zephaniah, the book that we're in today. A similar phrase used on that day is found 208 times in the whole Old Testament. And this day of the Lord was a day when God would intervene in the lives of his people with judgment and with salvation. You might remember what Ryan preached about last week from Habakkuk. Habakkuk 1 verse 6, the Lord says, for behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation. In the year 586 B.C., the Babylonians came into Jerusalem and destroyed that city. For the people in Zephaniah's day, this invasion from Babylon was an expression of the day of the Lord. It was a moment when God was intervening in history to bring judgment. But Zephaniah sees the day of the Lord as a distant reality in the future as well. It's like when we're driving through eastern Colorado and we're seeing the beautiful mountain ranging, ranges coming towards us. But from our perspective, we can't see the, the distance between the mountains or the depths of the valleys. Such is the day of the Lord. It's both near and it's far. It's a day... For God's people in Zephaniah's day, but it's also a future day on the horizon of time that Zephaniah can't see in his own time. The day of the Lord is still to come. This is a day coming where God will come to judge and to deliver. He will come to deal with all rebellion and sin, Israel's sin, the sin of the nations, my sin, and your sin. And so here's what I want us to see today. I want us to see that the day of the Lord is near. And in that nearness, for, for some of us, that, that day of the Lord is bad news. But the day of the Lord is also good news. That's the message of Zephaniah. 
So turn with me to Zephaniah chapter 1. We're going to start with verse 7. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. Why was the day of the Lord near in Zephaniah's day? We, we just have to go back a little bit to Zephaniah uh, chapter 1, verse 4. God says, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut off from this place the rem- remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priests along with the priests, those who bow down on the roofs to the host of the heavens, those who bow down and swear to the Lord, and yet swear by Milcom, those who have turned back from following the Lord, who do not seek the Lord or inquire of him. God's people had allowed the worship of false gods to synchronize with their worship of the one true God. The people of God were worshiping the Lord with their mouths and in their, in their practice, but the, their worship of the one true God was superficial. Their hearts were disordered, distracted by other gods. Where is this true for you? For me, I can easily wake up in the morning, make me a cup of coffee. I can read a psalm. I can journal and look out the window and just write about how awesome God is, the creator of all the universe and this sovereign king who's over every single detail of my life. I can have a good devotional time. But in an instant, I can feel like my life is spinning out of control with a situation at work or if I just glance at our personal finances, it stirs up all of this chaos in my soul. And instead of rather running to the Lord, just as I did earlier in the morning, what do I do? I get angry and I clean. I'm an angry cleaner. And it's not just tidying up. It's like, hey, I want this house to look like that we don't live here type of clean. And yet, after 15 years of marriage and having children, my family knows that when dad's cleaning, things are not right. (laughs) They know there's something wrong in my soul. I'm more worried about the disorder in the living room than the disordered desires in my own heart. Maybe for you, you proclaim how satisfying God is, and yet you find yourself again and again trying to find pleasure in lesser gods. Maybe you talk about how much you love the Lord, but you're bitter and angry with somebody in your gospel community. Maybe somebody who's in this very room right now. Maybe you sing about God being a refuge for you in times of trouble, but in anxious moments you find yourself consuming food or drink just to feel a bit of comfort. Trying to find relief by spending money, aimlessly walking around a store, filling your cart. We are superficial and half-hearted in our worship, aren't we? This is why God is stretching out his hand against his people. Because of their superficial and half-hearted obedience, they were bowing down to God and also to Milcom, a stone, lifeless idol that could not save them. They were worshiping God, but also false gods. And like the people of God in Zephaniah's day, the Bible repeatedly reminds us that we too will stand before the Lord and give account for all that we've done. We see this in Psalm 62, verse 12. For you, O Lord, will render to a man according to his work. 2 Corinthians 5. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Jesus even says in Matthew 25, he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. The day of the Lord is near. 
And it's easy for us to hear the day of the Lord is near, but never really heed the warning, never really act on it. But according to God's word, the day of the Lord ought to motivate us to holiness and to godliness. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, unexpected, disrupting our lives. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God? It's one of our core values here to say that that we exist to glorify God by cultivating spiritual renewal. We want to see that happen out there in our neighborhoods and in our workplaces and in our city. But are we paying attention to our own souls? Are we taking a spiritual inventory of ourselves, asking God to show us the ways in which we're worshiping him and yet also bowing down to false gods? Are we aware of those things? As we ponder this question that Peter poses to us, what sort of people ought you to be? We're faced with this second reality that Zephaniah teaches us. The day of the Lord is bad news. I don't know about you, but when somebody poses the the opportunity to hear bad news or good news first, I'm always going to go bad news. And that's what Zephaniah does for us this morning. And so we're going to go bad news first, okay? Look at uh, chapter 1, verse 14 in Zephaniah with me. The great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Verse 17. I will bring distress on mankind, so they shall walk like the blind, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, and their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of wrath of the wrath of the Lord, and the fire of his jealousy. All the earth shall be consumed, for a full and sudden end he will make all the inhabitants of the earth. The day of the Lord is bad news. It's bad news not just for God's people, but for the the nations surrounding Israel. In chapter 2, verse 5, Zephaniah begins to draw this map of the nations for us. Nations that will experience the day of the Lord as well. We see to the to west of Jerusalem, we have Philistia, and they, they, the Philistines inhabited that, that, that coastline of the Mediterranean Sea. To the east, Moab and Ammon. To the south, Cush. To the north, Assyria. This is Zephaniah's way of saying to God's people that the nations no, will, will not be able to escape the day. No tribe or tongue will be able to escape this bad news. No one is getting left out, and Jerusalem is smack dab in the middle. The day of the Lord is bad news. Why? Because on that day, the hearts of man will be exposed, will be laid out. And so Zephaniah highlights uh, uh, throughout his book a list of sins that Israel and the nations are being judged on. And these sins, we can identify with them as well. We see idolatry in chapter 1, verse 5. Today, we could even, when we use the word idolatry, we can use the word addiction. What do we go to when we have pain? What good things do we allow to become God things, like money and and food and security? We let those things eclipse the one true God taking residence in our hearts. That's idolatry. How about complacency in chapter 1, verse 12? This word complacent used here gives us images of stagnancy. Someone who has no vibrancy for God. They're just kind of meh. Autonomy and pride, chapter 2, verse 15. 
I am and there is no one else, the prideful says. We often put ourselves above God and above others. All that really matters is me and my fulfillment, my desires and my needs. And if God and others can't help me realize my true self, then away with them. It's about stubbornness. See this in Zephaniah 3, 1 and 2. When it comes to receiving correction from a pastor or a, a leader or a boss at work or even our own spouse, those of us that are married, we don't like that. We don't like somebody telling us what to do. We don't want to listen or accept what they say. And with God, we look at his scripture, and when something doesn't seem to fit our own thoughts, we neglect it. How about shameful deeds? Chapter 3, verse 11. We've all done something that we're ashamed to talk about. We try to hide it. We try to act like it didn't happen. We try to forget it. How about shameless deeds? Chapter 3, verse 3 through 5. These are the deeds that we've done knowing full well that God sees them and they may even be seen by others around us and we just don't care. We have no shame. Doesn't this list show us that we're all indicted? The day of the Lord is bad news. None of us will be, will be able to escape being exposed and being held accountable for all that we've done, good or evil. Romans 3, Apostle Paul shows us this as well. Verse 10, as it is written, no one is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. He says down in verse 19, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. None of us are going to be able to escape answering to God on the day of the Lord. This should feel weighty. This should feel significantly heavy to us. The day of the Lord is bad news. Everything will come into the light. All of your selfishness, all of your sin, all of your shame, all of the evil that resides in your hearts, all the things that you thought in your head but never said, all out, all exposed. The day of the Lord is bad news. We're not going to stop there. The very beginning of chapter 2 offers us a glimmer of hope. Look at it with me. Chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. Before the decree takes effect, before the day passes away like chaff, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord, seek the Lord. All you humble in the land who do his just commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. For those who seek the Lord, the day of the Lord is good news. Let's turn to Zephaniah 3, verse 11. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. Notice that verse 11 begins with the phrase, on that day. What day is this verse talking about? Well, if we back up to verse 8 in chapter 3, we see that this is the day when God will rise up to seize the prey, to gather the nations, to uh, assemble the kingdoms, to pour out upon them his indignation and burning anger. This seems to be talking about the day of the Lord, the final day of judgment at the end of time. We profess this in the St. Patrick's Confession. And yet, look at the promise in chapter 3, verse 9. For that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, 
that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshipers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. At that time, God says, the peoples will call upon the name of the Lord and serve him. On that day, the proud will be removed, as we see in verse 11. And all that will be standing are the humble and the lowly. How is that? Is it that the day of the Lord is both a day of judgment and a day of salvation? How is that in the fire of God's jealousy, all the earth shall be consumed, and God will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, so that they will call upon him with one accord? If all we had this morning was the... the three pages of Zephaniah in my Bible, we'd be left to kind of wonder about that. We could imagine and conjure up some ideas about what that might be. But what's amazing is that we have the rest of Scripture to show us what he meant. I want to read verse 9 again, chapter 3, verse 9. For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. Now, listen as I read Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and goes on listing Asia and Egypt and Libya and, and visitors of Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? does this mean? I'll tell you what it means. It means the day of the Lord is more than just one day. We thought that there was only one mountain range that we were looking at, one mountain. But as we get closer, we see that there's actually three days. The Babylon invasion that happened in, in 586 was a day of the Lord. The coming day of the Lord where God finally judges all things is the day of the Lord. And the day of Pentecost that we read here in Acts 2 is the day of the Lord. The day of Pentecost is a fulfillment of Zephaniah 3, 9. What is God doing? He's changing the speech of the people so that they all might serve him with one accord. This is a little day of the Lord. And by the way, the apostles saw the day of Pentecost as a culmination of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So really, we should say that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus and all that he accomplished in it is the day of the Lord. So we see how the day of the Lord can be both bad news for the proud and good news for the humble. You may be asking, how can the day of the Lord be good news for me? How can I get in on this? The answer is to repent humbly and to believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see this hinted in Zephaniah 3, verse 12, that the last half of verse 12. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. How can we be saved from God's judgment at the end of history? By seeking refuge in Jesus. 
who took the judgment for us in the middle of history. The day of the Lord is coming, but for those who trust in Jesus, the day of the Lord has already come. We can, we can look forward to that final day, not with fear, but with joy. This is why the book of Zephaniah ends with such a hopeful, joyful, worshipful note. Zephaniah 3, verse 14, look at it with me. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, not half-hearted. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Coram Deo Church, fear not. The day of the Lord is good news. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. The King of Israel, Jesus Christ, he's in your midst. He's here right now. And when you feel like you are just one big, unlovable mess, you are deeply loved by King Jesus. He rejoices over you. He accepts you. He takes you in. When you feel like you've sinned so much that you can't shift the trajectory in your life, the grace and love of King Jesus is greater than any sin you've ever committed and any sin you will commit. When you feel frantic and anxious and busy in your soul, King Jesus comes to you through the power of Holy Spirit and he quiets you with his love. As a mother goes to her fussy child in the middle of the night, sings to her, quiets her. Church, I need to hear these truths every single day. When I fall into idolatry and prideful unbelief, I need this good news. I need it so desperately. I need to seek Jesus, I need to find my refuge in him alone rather than going to all the other little things. May we never forget how much Jesus rejoices over us, how much he loves us, how much he accepts us. Doesn't Jesus sound like a king who's worth bowing down to? Doesn't he sound like a king worth submitting to? A Lord worth worshiping? He's inviting us to seek him. Let's look at his invitation again in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. He says to us, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land, who do his just commands. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. One of my favorite songs that we sing here at Coram Deo is Bring Your Sick. I like it because it gives me words to, to be honest about my own spiritual sickness, my own weakness, my own sin and anxieties and wounds. In the chorus that we sing, it's in the voice of Jesus. It's written as if Jesus is singing over us, inviting us to seek him, to find refuge in him. So Jared's going to sing this song, and rather than feeling the pressure to sing along, I just want you to prayerfully listen, as if Jesus is singing to you. He's singing his love over you and his acceptance over you. 
beckoning you to come seek him. Find refuge in him. And if you feel comfortable doing this, just open up your hands and put them out and say, Jesus, humble me. I want to seek you, Jesus. Let's listen to his invitation through this song. search for some elixir that could ease their gasping breath, some sweet drink to drive the poison from the writhing in their heads. Bring your wounded, all your broken, who can stand upon their own, who are weak beyond dignity, who will never become strong. They will only need more helping. Each investment is a loss. Yes, bring all those who could never return any of their cost. But Jesus Christ says, Gather to me all you lost, you poor, you I'm your sacrifice, your ransom. I was given in your stead. I have found you, freed you, healed you. My compassion you can trust. I'll redeem the undeserving. I am generous. 